What would you do with a brain if you had one? Personally, I give us one chance in three. At least now we know who's in charge. You ever get that sinking feeling? You know, the one that you feel you've only heard maybe half the story? Or even a different story altogether? Hello and welcome to the Red Pill Diary. I'm Lewis, and I'll be your host. So, ready or not, let's flip the switch and shed some light on it. The dark-haired man, dressed fatigues, stood alone on the edge of the tarmac. The air was thick from the wash of dust and exhaust from the engines of the two C-130Hs behind him. The noise was deafening, but he didn't really hear it. He looked at the sun, but he really didn't see it. What he saw was memories. He was like watching a movie. His mind traced their history, war, victory, more war, and then prison. He had started at the capital of Cyrenaikia because everything starts there. Then southwest from 25 degrees, 40 minutes, 47.994 seconds north latitude and 24 degrees, 40 minutes, 47.994 seconds east longitude. He led his troops into the disputed Azuyu Strip, his capture, and prison. He was a revolutionary soldier, but the rejection and humiliation of being disavowed, not just him, but his men while prisoners of war. Now he was used to hardships, fighting, death, prison. Chatty and prisons are brutal for others, but he and his men had it a bit easier. They had arrangements. Then the Americans showed up. They also had money and training camps. He had been in discussions before they arrived, but now... He would lead a new liberating force, and he would be its commander. His country wanted, no, it needed him, he thought. He would again rise to victory and unite his country. Despite his capture by Chadian troops in the Toyota War and the accusations he had employed Napalm and Galon, as some had called it, not all would join him, and he left them behind. What he and the Americans planned and financed was discovered. But the Americans still moved him to Kenya and then to Zaire, Their presence was causing political pressure on the French and the local government. It was time to leave. With him leading the Salvation Front, they would return to its rightful place. He smiled as he thought of that return. But more work had to be done. He felt the hand touch his shoulder. He glanced over to his right at the American motioning with his head towards the plains. He spoke, but he did not hear the words. He shook his head affirmatively. It was time to go. He turned and struck the man in the back as they walked to the aircraft and his 35 awaiting men. They had much training to do, but the end justifies the means, whatever means necessary, in Chad or Virginia, including asylum, passports, and all. He and his men will like Virginia, Khalifa Hafter said, smiling as he boarded the Air America flight in the fall of 1990. To set the stage... For this episode, we must return to 1937, to a tiny island at the junction of the Spree and Havel Rivers in Berlin. Constructed in the 16th century, Spandau Citadel is a square brick and stone fort with four stone bastions shaped like arrowheads. One side of the fort is bordered by the river, while moats form the other three sides. You cross a small drawbridge to the gatehouse, The single entrance provided additional security and hindered unwelcome visitors. It was the perfect spot for researching and discussing the accidental invention of the German chemist, Dr. Schrader. And what was his big secret accidental invention of German chemist, Dr. Schrader? It was the code name Galen. Enter Dr. Otto Ambrose, a plain chemist as he described himself, and he was selected to secretly develop synthesize, and mass-produce Dr. Schrader's invention. Sites were designated and concealed by design or their location. The pilot plant outside Munster was a government farm building and a compound in a rural forested area extending to 26 square miles, including a large zoo. In contrast, the Hochwerks plant had its main production facility underground with trees planted on the roof. And the Falkenhagen complex was an industrial bunker in the East Germany next to the Polish border. Production pursued slowly at first and then gradually ramped up over time. However, as resources became scarce, it was more difficult for them to build as the years passed on. By the end of 1944, 
These same top scientists launched a concerted effort to destroy their research, their documents, their testing protocols, removing sensitive items from Spandau Citadel, and shipping them west where the files and equipment were shredded and burned. However, despite their efforts, some documents and equipment remained in abandoned facilities in the east. One plant around Munster was disassembled, and its contents was taken to Great Britain for additional research and development as the United States, France, and the Soviet Union canvassed Europe for scientists before the others located and then relocated them in their sectors of influence. The Soviets captured the laboratory from Posen and the doctor in charge. The Soviets had both the science and the scientists. The race was on. In May of 1945, the U.S. government, through its Chemical Warfare Service, began receiving chemicals from Europe for testing on U.S. soil. The push for bringing these scientists intensified, including giving them passports, facilities to live in, to work, and continue their research in rockets and in chemistry, both in the United States and now occupied Germany. Names such as von Braun, Otto Ambrose, Reinhard Gehlen, Schreiber, Fritz Hoffmann, and others were brought to the U.S. They consulted with industry leaders and continued their research in New Jersey and at Rocky Mountain Arsenal outside of Denver, among other U.S. bases. The rocket and chemical races were on to secret away these scientists to exploit their research and continued development of the secret intelligence program, Operation Paperclip. Now let's stop here for a moment. During World War II, as we've seen here, the Germans were busy building rockets and researching and producing Galen or Tauben gas. Once the Allied forces realized what they had, they began to interrogate and investigate the individuals and secreted the scientists to the United States. They did this in quick fashion because Germany was carved up into control zones, France, the Soviets, United States and Great Britain, each having its sphere of influence. And they wanted to get these scientists to the United States so they could exploit this research, despite the underlying issues associated with the data that they've collected. And what were the issues with this science? One only has to look at the IG Farben trials at Nuremberg to understand exactly what those issues were. And this research and the data collected from it was a product of those issues. So what's this got to do with the price of eggs? Well, let's move to the present and see how these two are interrelated. So let me give you some background on Khalifa Haftar. Khalifa Haftar was a warlord who took part in the 1969 coup that brought Muammar Gaddafi to power. Fast forward to 1990, the CIA sponsored a deal with Canada to get Hafter and his men moved to the United States. Hafter lived near the agency's headquarters and maintained close relationship with several U.S. intelligence services. His soldiers and he were likely trained in this country by those intelligence agencies in a proxy endeavor, eventually failed, by the way, to overthrow Gaddafi. Apparently, Gaddafi was putting the squeeze on oil companies to pay for Lockerbie. Haftar is a Libyan-American. He runs much of eastern Libya, and he's the head of the Libyan National Army, where he controls Cyrenikia. Much of that country remained lawless, a haven for human traffickers, drug smugglers, and banditry. He was used in 2014, two years after Benghazi, by the U.S. to go after radicals. Instead, guess what? He became powerful, controlling most of Libya, and now four of his children serve in the LNA. The oldest is likely going to be the president. He controls most of the oil production and collects millions monthly in personal income. So let's talk about what's under the soil of, of what he controls. That's the Nubian Sandstone Aquifer System. It's the world's most extensive fossil water aquifer system in the world. It is located underground in the eastern end of the Sahara Desert. It spans the political boundaries of four countries in northeastern Africa. This sandstone aquifer covers a land area including northwestern Sudan, northeastern Chad, southeastern Libya, and most of Egypt. And Libya has this project called the Great Man-Made River. It uses this system, this water, and extracts substantial amount of, of water from this aquifer for annual consumption and agriculture. 70% of Libya's freshwater originates in this aquifer. 
Libya has no natural rivers. And guess who controls this aquifer? Or it's in the area of his control. Khalifa Haftar. So this area significantly is controlled by him. It's internationally recognized human trafficking, narcotics, and weapons extensive smuggling corridor. Al Yaf is an official and unofficial detention site. It's used for human trafficking. Al Yaf is the road to Tobruk or to Benghazi on the Mediterranean, Al Juf is to Khartoum in Sudan to the Red Sea, and two significant routes exist from Somalia through these countries. One route goes through this area to the Mediterranean. The other route flows to the convergence of the White Nile and the Blue Nile from the Gulf of Aden to the Mediterranean. By the way, the Azusa Strip has a bunch of minerals, including uranium. And this area is controlled by Khalifa Haftar. So you ask me, how are these two seemingly unrelated historical events connected? Well, let me say, I think, because it's my diary, I think it's at least three ways. First, our government's involvement in its kind of apparent disregard for, or at least overlooking, some of the unsavory activity. That's an understatement on several levels. Secondly, the desire for information or power associated with people and their connections for some alleged, quote-unquote, greater good. And thirdly, the outcomes produced through the, our government's action and the damage before and after are significant and has, oh, let's just say, severe negative impacts globally, regionally, locally. Operation Paperclip brought scientists with unclean hands to the United States. Our government was aware of the extent of their participation. I mean, the Nuremberg trials are filled with volumes of evidence. The resulting issues in that experimentation and development of the science, they overlooked these activities to save and continue the research that these individuals back in 1940s, they knew. These were people that went over to interview were experts in the field at the time of the people they were interviewing. They knew the development of Dr. Schrader's Galon gas. They knew it was obtained through tainted means. They knew there was experimentation that was going on. They knew that they were subjects that they'd use. They knew this. So while on the one hand, they're decrying the outcome of certain types of behavior, let's say in the Nuremberg trial, while on the other hand, they're trying to develop it even further, such as the use of the Taubin gas to sarin to VX. They took that research and that information and developed it even further. The chemists from all countries, including the industry's leaders, they knew it. Our government knowingly brought it here and then rationalized how it was obtained and then continued its research on U.S. soil intending to use it. And as we've seen over history, others have. Now, the most recent example, you see where our government saved and trained a revolutionary on U.S. soil with the paramilitary people in tow. He gave them citizenship. They gave them payments. They gave them houses, and they prepared this revolutionary group for a failed attempt to overthrow the government of a sovereign nation. Now, let's put aside the personal belief of whether it's whether they like the guy, whether he was evil or doing evil things. The fact is, the person they put in there is doing exactly the same thing as the person that they previously deposed Miller was doing. Remember, nothing passes through the corridor of this individual controlling eastern Libya without his tacit approval, at least, and compensation. These corridors in eastern Libya, it goes right down the corner, it goes straight to Benghazi, and it goes to Tripoli. That goes straight into the corner of Libya, into the Sudan, and from Sudan, it goes straight into the Red Sea. From Sudan, it goes straight up through Khartoum, which sits on the convergence of the, the Blue and the White Nile, straight up into Egypt and into the Mediterranean. From Somalia, it goes through these countries, drugs, human trafficking, you name it, it goes through this place. And when it gets to Libya and this area, the person our government put in place is making a ton of money and controls it. Now, I recognize the world is a dangerous place. I'm not naive. The reason these two are together is look at the information that we know about these two now that we didn't know before. There are others. And we're going to get to those. At this point in the jury, it's not to assert that I have all the answers. I just get more questions. It's not to point the finger, but to look at the events and search for connections and undercurrents. Connections like we see here, the tie between these two events. 
They're not exact, but the underlying rationale being used to bring in scientists who have done all kinds of stuff, allow them to continue their developing of Taubin gas in this country with the potential use around the world. And we've seen it being used. Syria, allegedly in Chad, and likely other places, but it's still out there, not just in the hands of what we would consider good people. It's in the hands of armed brokers, the same people that are going and taking arms up into, through these corridors in Sudan and uh, Libya. Well, they show up in Benghazi. They show up all over the world because it's all going through this corridor. This is the person that our government thought was such a great idea to train them and put him in this place. And look what you have. This is not the only incident. Think about recently, 2014. We had a hand, we know now, in the coup that happened in Ukraine. Now we've got this other guy in here. Is he any better than the one they had before? Well, maybe, but we're sure paying him a lot more money than we did the other guy. I would think the savings alone would have been worth the other, the other gentleman in there, let alone the person you currently have there. So we're paying him for some reason. If you look at the two and start thinking about what we've seen in history, you have to ask, why are we paying that kind of money? Nobody knows. We have no accountability. Everybody's complaining about it, at least the people I hear, but no one's doing anything about it. As you start to go through history and start seeing these correlations, we're going to find that you're, you're going to start, or I am, asking more questions because my eyes are open. I'm seeing these types of connections and I'm saying, wait a minute, if it happened then, what's the possibility or probability, likelihood that it's going to happen now or has happened or will happen? And we won't know about it for 50 years. Why? Because everything's made secret. So no one knows. There's no transparency. So you would know because they're not going to tell you. And we have a sycophantic media that's not going to tell you except for what big government wants you to know. It's not a conspiracy theory. We see it happen every single day. It just happened this week. One week, one thing. This week, total opposite of that. Those both can't be true. Truth is sometimes uncomfortable, but ignoring it allows for uncontested repeats of things that's happened before. It provides an opportunity to repeat because it was known, but not known by me or you. You know, I... I was once told, you don't know what you don't know. Now I know what I did not know. I'll leave the lights on for you. Well, we filled those pages. If you have comments, suggestions, share them. You know, the more input, the more likely a better outcome. I'm moving forward because backwards is not an option. I've turned the lights on here and I'll be leaving them that way. Join me next time on The Red Pill Diary.